Hey, everyone. Um, as Lee just said, I'm Sasha Solomon, and I'm a software engineer at Medium. You can find me on Medium at Sachi and also on Twitter at Sachi. It's the same thing. Um, so I'm actually really excited to talk about this because there's been hints of it um, throughout this conference. So I'm actually going to show you how my team and I have been mig migrating Medium's code base without slowing down. Um, so first off, why? Why are we doing this migration? Um, well, first, our existing front end was slowing developers down, and people didn't really like working in it, so we wanted to change that. Um, also, our existing back end is slowing developers down, and people are afraid to make changes in it, so we wanted to change that too. And our system is slow. <laughs> Um, parts of the system are slow, but because of how our system is architected, uh, the slow pieces end up affecting pieces that would normally be performant. So it, the whole system ends up being slow. Um, so what are the goals of this migration? Um, first off, we wanted to improve the developer experience, making it faster and more intuitive. And then we wanted to improve the performance of Medium. Um, this is no easy task. As you might know, migrations are notoriously difficult, and especially without a migration plan or a unified interface. Um, so we also had another goal, which was to do this all without hindering product development. That's a little bit harder. Um, but we did it with uh, the design of our new system in mind. So first, um, what, what, what are the, some, some of the goals of this, this new system? Um, first off, we wanted an easy-to-use client. Um, we wanted people to be able to develop more easily um, and make it just easy all around. Um, we also wanted smaller services with a unified interface, more performance services, and this interface would be able to talk to those services. And then lastly, we wanted to make sure that the business logic actually lived within those services. Um, we didn't want it to be kind of coming up into our unified interface. We didn't want any um, confusion there. And yes, we needed to do this without hindering product development. We can't migrate everything all at once. That would be really hard. So we have to come at it at a, a different way. Um, so we came at it with a more phased approach. Um, so remember that we had two goals in mind for this migration, uh, developer productivity and performance. So let's start off with phase one, developer productivity. Um, so in this phase, um, we wanted to make sure that GraphQL interfaces between our new client and our legacy uh, API server. Um, so we were able to start migrating piece by piece. And then also, we wanted to leverage our existing data descriptions. We actually use protobufs, um, but not quite using them as protocol buffers right now. They're mostly just a schema. But we can leverage these, and it sets, up, sets ourselves up for phase two of this migration. So we'll take a look at what this looks like right now. So um, this is what medium is, and there's going to be a lot of diagrams here. Um, so first off, we, our new client is going to be React.js. Um, so we have our cool new React client. And our unified interface is going to be GraphQL. Um, so now we have GraphQL talking to our new client. Um, and then, obviously, GraphQL needs to talk to some sort of data source. Um, so for us, starting off, this data source, no surprise, is our legacy API server. Um, so it's important here that all of our business logic is obviously staying in our back end. And we actually have our protobufs already. So like I said, we're not using them as a protocol, more of a schema. Um, and so because we're using them as a schema and we already have them, we're actually able to derive our GraphQL schema from them. And we'll have a little more bit about that later. Um, so this is really cool because we're able to harness the power of GraphQL um, without having any discrepancies between our protobufs and what the client wants. So this new system is actually being built alongside our old system. Um, so this means we're actually able to migrate without hindering product development. Um, we can migrate the client-side code to the new system without negatively affecting product development. Um, our product engineers get the flexibility to work on our new tools sooner and provide value sooner. Which brings us to phase two. So phase two gets a little more complicated. Um, parts of phase two were breaking out our old REST API into smaller services. Um, so to start chipping away at our old server-side code. Um, we're not really talking microservices here, just services. It can be anything. Um, even parts of our old system might stay in place. Um, but what's important is that we migrate parts out that make sense into services that make sense. 
and they will be more simp like simpler, more modular, and hopefully more performant. So slowly, our pieces of our system can be separated, and they'll have dedicated resources, and other services might remain unaffected. Um, so in doing this, we're actually able to retire our legacy system over time. Uh, the more we break out uh, smaller services, we can end up getting, um, getting rid of our old legacy stuff. Which finally leads us to performance. Um, so in doing all of this, in the end, that means we end up with something more performant than what we had originally, which is also one of our goals. So this is what we had before. This is the phase one. Um, and we have our legacy API server. We have GraphQL talking to it as a data source. And so with phase two, what we get is something like this. Um, so some people have been talking about this at the conference already, um, but this is sort of what Medium has been doing. Um, we have our GraphQL server still talking to a data source, and we have our legacy API server still in there, but we're slowly able to like, break apart um, our old API server and turn them into services. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so as you can see, uh, those are the new services that are like, actually running alongside our old API server. Um, and they're not really microservices, they're just services. And uh, eventually, um, we can actually start using gRPC uh, for inter-service-to-service -service communication, and our GraphQL st server can start using gRPC as well. Like I said, we have protobufs already, so this actually makes it really easy. Um, yeah, so here's our services. Um, and like I said, as we start breaking apart stuff, um, we can actually start using gRPC from our GraphQL server. So if we do this and we keep doing this, eventually we end up with something like this. Um, so if you can see the difference between these two uh, slides, um, this is like what we finally wanted to end up with. This is our final architecture. Um, we got rid of our old API server, and now we have these services. And like I said, these might be partially related to our uh, old REST API server. They won't be talking REST anymore. They might be using gRPC, but they're split up, and we've made them more performant. Um, so like we wanted in the first place, we have our clean, intuitive client, which is React. We have our modular performance services. And we have a unified interface, GraphQL, to tie everything all together. Um, but none of this would have been possible without our GraphQL server. So we actually designed a lot of our GraphQL server to help with this migration. So let's look a little bit about into what um, the structure of our GraphQL server looks like. Um, so it's important to, in the design of our GraphQL server to consider that we are dealing with legacy data. Um, because of this, we wanted to make sure there was a clear uh, separation of concerns. So first, it should be easy to alter the shape of the raw data. Legacy data coming in shouldn't affect what the client wants. Um, it should also be clear what, um, what data is for the client. There shouldn't be any confusion about what data is being fetched and what data is raw. Um, the data, it should be clear what data um, is for the client explicitly. And then lastly, it should be easy to add new data sources. We shouldn't have to, it should be easy to add new data sources without having to change everything. Um, it shouldn't require a lot of code changes every time we want to change something. Um, so here is what our GraphQL server layers would look like. So we have fetchers, repositories, and our schema. Um, and so here, we can kind of see how they're sort of flowing together. So these are just all the layers of our GraphQL server. Um, so we can kind of see how data flows through here. You have like, we have our little yellow blob here, and this little box is maybe our legacy API server or whatever. Um, so as you can see, as the data moves through our system, um, it changes and becomes a circle, which is what the client needs. Um, but I can't do a lot with this diagram, so let's look into this a little further. So first off, fetchers. Um, maybe obviously, fetchers are for fetching data from data sources. So back to our diagram. Um, we're pulling data out of our, our backend endpoint, um, which can be REST, or maybe it's gRPC, or whatever. And the data that is fetched should have already gone through any business logic or changes. So that should have already happened in our service or in our legacy server. Um, and in, during this part, uh, we require a protobuf. So that squiggly line is what our protobuf is. We want to make sure we serialize the data coming through to whatever our protobuf says. Um, so once we do that, the little blob continues and it goes on its merry way to the next step. So again, to reiterate, 
Um, fetches correspond to an, a, an endpoint, um, which can be REST or gRPC, whatever. In this case, when we're first starting off, um, it was uh, our REST API. Um, and then uh, make sure that there, it's already gone through any business logic, and there's a protobuf that's required. So let's look at what this might look like in code. So here we have an example of our fetcher. Um, this is all in Scala. It's not too scary. It's pretty simple here. Um, so we have a fetcher trait, which is like an interface. And uh, all fetchers must conform to this trait. Um, and so all fetchers actually have a get method for actually fetching the data. Um, and so here, we see what a post fetcher might actually look like. So here we can kind of see um, our get method being defined. And you'll see the post type there. Um, that's actually our protobuf. That's the type that we're saying our protobuf is. And then you can also see the API endpoint there. Um, so you can actually see sort of how we're sort of making the fetcher and how this might work. So once we have our fetcher, next up is repositories. So repositories or repos are what the GraphQL schema will use as a data representation. So back to our cute little diagram. Um, we have our little blob floating through now, and now we're at the repos step. So we've already gone through our protobuf. That schema should already be good. Um, so what's the purpose of our repos step? Um, well, in the repos step, we want to clean up data from our data sources and store it in our repos. We want to, in this step, we can kind of hoist up fields, move data around, um, basically whatever we need to make the data uh, in the shape that the client needs. So again, we don't do any business logic here. That should have already happened way prior. Um, we just need to change the data shape to be what we need. Um, so we shape data in this step. Um, also, we use the fetchers. Repositories always use fetchers. Um, so any data that's retrieved uh, should be retrieved from fetchers. And repos don't actually know how to fetch data themselves. They only know how to use fetchers. So again, repos create the data shape we want. Um, they don't actually know how, like, where to get the data from. So here we have an example of what the repo might look like in code. So we have our repo trait. Again, it's kind of like an interface. And all repos conform to this trait. Um, and it only knows about fetchers. It doesn't know how to fetch the data. It just knows how to, it knows to use a fetcher. And we're actually defining a multi-get here. Um, and it is actually going to get the data. The, or the get is actually defined for us. So this is what the post repo looks like if we implement that trait. Um, so here we're actually implementing our multi-get. And you can notice that the, the post here is actually a repo post. Remember, we've already actually used our, um, our protobuf post. Um, so in the post step, we can actually, we're actually defining this post as a Scala case class, um, which is kind of like a class or a data object. Um, and so in this post, we can plop in any fields we want, whatever we want. Um, what's important is that the post here in this post repo is whatever the data um, shape needs to be. Um, so we're actually able to get the raw data, and then we transform it into the data we need. And so here is our schema. Um, the GraphQL schema, obviously, takes the form the client needs. Um, so the, in this GraphQL schema, we can see this is like the final step. Um, so we've already seen the data flowing through our fetchers. It's gone through the protobuf schema. And we've already gone through our repos um, and changed the data into the shape we need. So now it's the final step. Um, the GraphQL schema should only get data from repos. It'll never access fetchers directly. Um, so in, similar with um, our repos objects who only know how to use fetchers, um, our GraphQL schema only knows how to use the repos. And this is the cool part. Uh, all of our schemas are actually derived from our repo objects. We don't actually do anything with our GraphQL schema directly. So this is cool because that means there's no confusion about what the data shape is or where it's OK or where it's not OK to manipulate it. Um, it's always done in the repo step. In the GraphQL schema, we can just derive it. So what does this look like? Um, so here we have an example of what our schema might look like. Um, this should look fairly familiar. It's in Scala, but it is pretty similar through all the languages. Um, so we have our main schema, we have a medium query, and we define our query. We have a name, um, which is post. We have our field type, which is also post. Notice here that the post um, type here is actually a GraphQL type. 
um, not the repo type and not the fetcher type. And then you can see in our resolve function that we're actually getting things from our post repo. So on all of our resolvers, we can do this. Um, so let's look, like, let's look at what our post schema might look like. So it's actually really simple. Um, the post type that we were using in the previous slide is this same post. Um, so it's actually really, really simple. And the post type um, here in the derive object type is actually our repos post. So again, we're deriving all of this from our repos where we actually shape the data. So then in our schema, it's really simple. So putting this all together, we, have, we see sort of how our data flows through our GraphQL server. So we have things coming in through our endpoint. Um, it's a blob, it looks terrible, and then we get it through our protobuf schema. Um, it's starting to look a little better, we've serialized it. It's going through our repos, we shape it a little more to what the client wants, and then when it finally goes through our GraphQL schema, it's actually perfect in exactly what we wanted. So. Um, Migrating without slowing down, which is what we've done. Um, so we did all this, and we designed it with migration in mind. So what's cool is that migrating a system is hard, but with GraphQL, it's actually made migrations a lot easier. Um, we're able to design a system that was migration friendly. We were able to uh, migrate off an old system without hindering product development, and we were able to gain benefits of the new system along the way. And that's a pretty sweet place to end up. Thanks, everyone.